on the wrong slide. Okay, we just went back in time. Hi, everybody. Please uh, flag me down if you're having any trouble seeing me or hearing me, but I'm going to assume all is well. Welcome to our second to last session of Pub 101 with the Open Education Network. I would just like to take a moment and thank all of you stalwarts for sticking with it and um, committing to Pub 101 for the last several weeks. I know there are so many demands on your time and so much going on in our lives. I really appreciate um, that you have joined us for this uh, experience together. And I, I hope that um, you can just kind of take a moment and acknowledge that for yourself, because I think sometimes it's really hard to stick with things in our busy professional lives. So with that, I am going to take a look at our time together today. So where are we in the Pub 101 plan? We are going to continue to talk about project management. And um, I'm going to show you a couple of publishing policy examples that I think continue our conversation over the last couple weeks, especially. I like these two examples because they show two different systems. One is an institution, one is a consortium communicating to authors, here's what our publishing program looks like. Here's what we want from you. Here's what we can provide. I just think there are two really nice examples. And then, thing, then I'll turn things over to Corinne Guimont, who will talk about her many experiences publishing open textbooks. And we were just chatting before the session started about her most recent experience. So it'll be fun to hear those stories. So you will recall that we have planned for your program capacity. We've talked about launching and communicating your publishing program, no matter what it looks like, through a call for proposals and an MOU. And Corinne, I know, is going to talk today a lot about communicating as the project progresses. Today's session is really a, kind of about what do you do while the authors are writing? What can you do to keep the project moving and complete it and, and bring it home? And then next week when Kevin joins us, we'll talk about printing and celebrating completed projects. So now for those examples that I wanted to show you. Um, this first one is from Palney Press. They are, uh, I think it's the private academic library. Uh oh. Um, if somebody knows their acronym, please put it in the chat. But they're in Indiana and they're a consortium of libraries. And they recently launched the Palney Press. And what I really like about it is they have a mission statement, why they exist, they talk about who is eligible for their support. And then they go right into responsibilities that authors who want to publish with the Palney Press agree to. Um, and then they talk a little bit more about some of the basic level services that they provide. And they sort of imply that this initiative may grow with time, but here's what we're doing right now. They're defining it very clearly. Um, they talk about, for example, uh, platform support, and they can currently provide limited services and troubleshooting, training, workflow design, and then they're very explicit about what they do not provide. There's a bulleted list there of what they are not in a position to provide authors at this time. And then they discuss briefly copyright, privacy, diversity, and accessibility. So this is, you know, one page of information on a WordPress site introducing the press to the people who they may serve. And I think it's a really great example of a new program defining its parameters and communicating those parameters to stakeholders. The second example I want to share with you is from Indiana University Bloomington. Here they're describing a course material transformation fellowship. Some of you may have seen this. I think it was shared on a listserv recently. Um, and this is you know, very recent, just in last fall, and they're framing their program within COVID. Um, they're talking about eligibility, again, expectations. Uh, you may recall Karen Bjork talked about authors attending workshops. Here, the same expectation is, is there as well. Authors will attend three professional development workshops. There'll be at least one consultation. So it's really kind of laying out, here's what we're going to provide. Here's what we're looking at. Um, for from you, here's the timeline. Um, you'll also see that they map out, you know, when they're paid and upon what deliverables with the calendar. And then they share some sample activities 
and the kind of support they're going to provide, as well as getting into some of the application and evaluation criteria. So I just think these are two great examples um, as you may think about supporting publishing and communicating what it is you can do either as one person or as a program. So back to the slides here. I would now like to talk briefly about the homework you may decide to do between this session and the next session. Uh, what it says in the Pub 101 orientation document is skim units four and five for familiarity with editing and design concepts. And the reason why I'm highlighting the word skim is it might be overwhelming to you. It might be too much information. It might be more than you ever want to know about editing and design. But they, this information may be useful if you want to see how editing works at a publishing services provider, in this case, Scribe. They were an early partner for us in developing the publishing cooperative at the OEN, and they shared with us how they do things um, within their organization to support publishing. And Corinne has actually worked with Scribe and, and can talk more about that if any of you are interested. And these units may be useful if you want ideas for how to work with authors in Word. Now, of course, Word is not an open source publishing program. And many people feel that if we're going to be publishing openly, we should only be using open source programs. Um, and I totally get that. Others may feel that, hey, I want to meet authors where they're at. And I know authors love to write in Word. And I'm working with someone who already has a manuscript fin you know, almost finished in Word. And so this um, material in these units may provide some examples of how you could work with somebody who already has a manuscript in Word. So all that to say, you know, it's, it's information is there for you. It may not be relevant at this time. So um, I just kind of want to share that as a caveat. I also want to share another friendly reminder tomorrow already is office hours on how to engage student leaders in OER. It's at 1 p.m. Central, and you can find us at the link there. We have four great guests, um, many of whom are students or um, working professionals who have worked with students who can talk about how they have collaborated together to get some momentum going um, on o for OER on their campus. So as uh, many of you could probably predict, I'm going to do a quick poll and then hand things over to Corinne. So I'd like to just take a moment to introduce her briefly. Uh, Corinne Guimont is the Digital Scholarship Coordinator at Virginia Tech Libraries, and um, she has a lot of experience publishing textbooks and is going to share her project management tips and tricks with you. As always, please uh, put anything in the chat that you would like to hear more about, and I'll keep an eye on that, and we'll have plenty of time for questions. So now I'm going to stop sharing and toggle over to our poll. Things are a little clunky due to my technical difficulties last week. They have yet to be resolved, but I think we can manage. With any luck, you are looking at a publishing project management poll. The first question, do you use a project management tool that you recommend? This as always is anonymous. Uh, the options include Trello, Basecamp, Asana, Slack, Jira, Google Spreadsheets, or something else. Let us know what you use. There may be others who want to hear about it. Second question, how would you describe your familiarity with style guides? For example, ALA, MLA, CMS. You uh, may not be familiar with style guides at all, or you might be familiar with style guides but don't actively use them. And I suspect there are many of you who know and use one or more style guides. Again, this is anonymous, uh, so please let us know in the next few seconds, a little bit more about your work life. All right, we have about 70% uh, polling returns. So I'm going to end our poll and share the results with you. Oh, lots of people working in Slack and lots of people working in other. In the chat, I would love to know what other is. Maybe it's your own system. For years, I loved using those giant paper calendars. 
to map out my project deadlines. It was very helpful for me to have that on my actual desk. So if you have your favorite tools, please put them in the chat if it was not included here. Notion, hmm, I will look into that, Laura, thank you. And then second question, about half and half. Most of you are familiar with style guides. Half of you use them actively and the other half, not really. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we will talk more about all of these things as the hour progresses. So without further ado, Corinne, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so that was actually a really timely introduction talking about policies because we've, with uh, Virginia Tech Publishing, where I'm at, we've actually been updating some of our content on our website <laughs> to talk more about what we do. Um, so I'm Corinne. I am a digital scholarship coordinator in, at Virginia Tech um, in Virginia Tech Publishing. It's a unit within our library on campus. Um, we publish open educational resources, textbooks, um, also regular books, journals. Uh, we've done some papers and reports, as well as digital humanities projects. And recently, we've started launching some podcasting stuff. Um, I primarily work on open educational resources and digital humanities projects. I've also previously worked at, um, actually worked at Cengage as a content digitization project manager for about six months right out of grad school several years ago. Um, so kind of a little bit of mix of publishing experience. I've been at Virginia Tech for about four years now, which is bizarre to say, because I feel like I still just started. <laughs> um, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about working with authors. I don't want to go into too much depth here, because I'm sure you covered it a lot when you um, talked to Carla about MOUs, um, but just kind of reiterating the really need to when you're working with any authors on any project, whether it's a book project, OER, even a digital humanities project, um, ex it define those expectations and that should be done probably in the CFP and the MOU. Also another good thing to do early on is to find the best mode of communication. A lot of you said Slack was a good use of project management. That's also something I use a lot for communication. I'm a big fan of it. Um, Another one is email, um, also talking with your authors and editors, what works best for them. Some of my people prefer things like Slack. I've also worked with people who have no idea what Slack is and have no interest in learning what Slack is. <laughs> so those folks I primarily work with over email. Um, and then there's also this author intake document that I'm pretty sure you all have access to and I would highly recommend taking a look at that because that's kind of a good place to get started. Um, some other things to consider when working with authors uh, is choose, well, with choosing your project management tool or app. Make sure if you're all at the same institution, some institutions have like a license already for these things. Um, at Virginia Tech, we have access to, I believe, Asana and Basecamp. So those are two that I use a lot um, based on what people want and also considering what I have access to, especially when it comes to the full capabilities of the tools. Um, and then also taking a look at, is it something I'm already using or is this gonna be something else I have to add? I currently am in Asana, Basecamp, Slack, Google, Spreadsheets, email. I work on so many different platforms. So when I'm talking to somebody and they're suggesting a new platform, I kind of say, okay, can we maybe talk about a potentially a different, like one of the ones I'm already using, is there some place that we can meet in between? But also considering maybe what are the authors are using? And is this something that they're comfortable in? Because where they're comfortable is always helpful to make it easier to work together. And then making sure everyone knows how to use it. And you also have kind of shared guidelines on how to use it. Um, I always kind of say when talking about tools like this, the tool is only as good as how you use it. Meaning you can say, yeah, we're gonna use um, Asana. We're gonna put all these to-do items in Asana. But if you're not updating it regularly, if everybody's not on the same page in terms of where items go on those to-do lists, it can get messy really fast and it can be a little confusing. Um, so making sure you have clear guidelines that everybody is aware of and um, that you're following them. So we talked about these a little bit already. Basecamp is really kind of a to-do list. There's also a way to have, um, like there's a campfire, it's called campfire, it's like a messaging board in there. 
Jira, I don't think anybody responded that they're using Jira, but this is what we actually used at SignBH. It's a ticketing system. It's fairly common with um, IT departments. And then Trello is more of a dashboard. Um, something I recommend, if you're not using a tool regularly, you can set up email notifications. And that way, if you are checking your email regularly, you get those notifications in your email that remind you to go to that project management tool. Uh, when we were at SignGage, we did this regularly, even though I was on Jira pretty much all day. But I would still have those notifications so that way I was aware like something's happening with this project right now and do I need to check it or not. So other things to do again these are probably established in the MOU and the CFP but it's always a good thing to revisit again and again. Um, but things to discuss might be the end result. Are you looking for a print book, something that is handy and in print, or do you want something that is only online? Um, if you're doing kind of a mix, something that's online and both, is there um, preference given to one or the other? I think really looking at what that end result is gonna look like can really motivate a lot of the conversations you'll have with the authors while they're writing and while you're um, producing the book. Um, for example, we've worked on books and press books and having clear options of the editor or the author is going to go in and write this content in press books and then we'll go in and edit it at this point in time really helps make that um, understanding. And if they're planning on using press books as the main reading tool, like the students are going to be using press books, that's helpful to know. Or do they want to export the content from press books into print? which can be a whole nother thing. So this was actually a book that was done from press books to print. And there are some pages, let me see, like with a lot of white space. So of course I can't find one when I'm trying to show it, <laughs> but that's, that's something to consider, especially when you have lots of figures. Um, so for this one, there's also a lot of media things. So we, that's why we chose press books um, to incorporate that media. Um, but then when it comes to the print version, it's not necessarily as print ready as, as you would expect. So that's something to consider. Uh, other things are rights and licensing, which I'm sure you've all talked a lot about, and the time commitment. How long do we expect this project to take, both for your sake and the author's sake? Um, some authors don't want to spend a year working on a textbook. They just want to get it done. Um, a book we recently just finished ended up taking over a year. <laughs> um, I think about a year and a half or so. And there was an expectation that this would be done within six months. And that was completely not, not gonna happen. And we just kind of had to have a conversation about that. And again, and again, as things changed and as things evolved, we had to revisit that conversation. And that kind of leads nicely into the schedule. Do they need it by a certain time? Are they planning on teaching with this book in this certain semester that they need this done by? And then is it actually doable? Can this be done? And if it's not, is there a way that we can work together to come up with a solution that does work? Um, other things to discuss and this a lot this depends on kind of your capacity and your program design. So again, looking at those policies that Karen showed earlier um, is really helpful in thinking about these things. But what is the structure of the book? Are there parts? Are there chapters, sections? Are there chapters within sections, within parts? <laughs> Um, any styles that are used, do they have a specific style sheet, uh, AMA or CMS or MLA? And then any special or trick items, this is really, really important. Uh, tables tend to be especially tricky, not just for layout, but also for accessibility purposes. Math is very, very tricky, definitely for accessibility, but also for layout and how it's viewed. Um, also, sometimes equations will get lost in translation as you're moving things around I've learned which is really bizarre but I've had random figure or random uh, what's the word I'm looking for like letters or numbers pop up in equations that weren't there in the original text and the authors are going I didn't put this in there what's going on so making sure you're aware of that in advance is helpful um, figures, especially more complex figures, are good to know about and um, any foreign language. And then one that I don't have on here, but I recently ran into is computer code. Uh, so the book that we just did has computer code in it. And it is very tricky to work with. Actually, I pulled up that page. So this is what it ended up looking like in the book. Um, <laughs> And we had to go back and forth with our vendors. We worked with Scribe for this uh, introduction to biosystems engineering book. And I went back and forth with them several times on the editors of the book to say, 
is this correct? Is this readable? Because the way we originally saw it, it turns out that if a student had typed that code into their computer, it wouldn't have worked at all. So that's very important to make sure that you're presenting that information in a way that would actually give the student the solution that they need. And then also thinking about what's the writing method and are they gonna stick with this writing method? Um, so again, Karen mentioned Microsoft Word or other tools. Um, those are all very common. I have three books in front of me and I can tell you what each method was. So the introduction to biosystems engineering was all written in Word and then we used the scribe workflow for layout and design. Um, this second edition of Fundamentals of Business was written in Word and then imported to press books. <laughs> and then I also have this electromagnetics engineering book, which was actually all written in LaTeX and then we generated a PDF from the LaTeX. Um, so those are all very different workflows. It was very different experience working on each of these books. I did very different things for each one in terms of the technical pieces. Working with the author was pretty much the same across all of them, but making sure you're aware of that beforehand so that way you know what's coming your way and you also know who else you need on your team um, to work on this book. Do you need Maybe a student worker can help. Do you need to hire student workers? Um, are you working with a vendor? If you're working with Scribe, do you, when do you need to let them know by, get them involved, make sure that they're aware of the project? Um, and are there other people maybe in your library or at your university that you might wanna to talk to? And then finally, the accessibility piece is a really big one, especially when it comes to the alt text for different images. You wanna make sure you have a conversation about who's creating the alt text. It can be very time consuming for yourself to do it. I know it's also a lot of authors don't want to do that because it can be very time consuming, um, but it's also important because especially with an engineering textbook, I have a bachelor's degree in English. I don't know how to read these figures and I don't know how to write alt text for them. So making sure that the authors can provide some of that information and that um, expertise for the, that piece. I also wanted to talk a bit about style guides and I'm kind of gonna take this a step further from the ALA and MLA and CMS that we're all very familiar with um, because I've seen style guides used in a couple of ways for a ex whole publishing program and also for specific books. And sometimes these go together. So in looking at style guides for a publishing program, um, it can be really great to use an existing one, something like the Chicago Manual of Style and build off of that. And also think about, does do you have a specific branding for your program that you want to build into your books? Do you want your books to kind of have some visual, like connected some way? Do you, you want them all to be a certain size um, or use a certain font? A lot of our books use specific fonts and I can't remember the font off the top of my head right now. Um, so thinking about those things as well as, so a lot of our textbooks tend to be bigger. These are big compared to, and I don't have one of our regular books in front of me, but a lot of our just general books tend to be about this size. So these are things to consider and we try to make it so our textbooks are roughly all the same size and our other books, our monographs are roughly about the same size. So that way there's some consistency with what's coming out of our publishing program. But then there can also be specific style guides for a book. Um, these could be on their own. Maybe you don't have a full program and you just really wanna focus on what does this book need to follow for in terms of style. Or it could also be taking your publishing program style guide and saying, okay, but I know that this book has computer code and equations and tables, and I wanna make sure that they look a certain way, especially when working with vendors. Um, so that is actually something I am <laughs> working on. So this introduction to biosystems engineering book, we are looking to in the future add new chapters and sections. Um, so before doing that, we ran into so many issues with all of the different types of complex content that we are actually going to be building a specific book style guide for this project moving forward. So anybody who looks at it can say, okay, that's what an equation is supposed to be looked like. That's how an equation is supposed to be tagged following the scribe workflow or composed following the scribe workflow. And this is how the table is supposed to be look like and <laughs> all of those pieces. And that kind of helps with the continuity of things too. So if I'm not always involved on this project, maybe in the future, somebody who is understands those decisions. 
Oh, and I also I had a note on here about considering how the tool or the platform used might affect your style guide. Um, and mainly thinking about if you're using something like Pressbooks versus Scribe, those two outputs have very different looks. So if your publishing program or if your book is using a specific tool or platform, considering what, how is that gonna affect the look and feel of the book um, in the long run? And how do you want, it, do you want to build that into your style guide or is that something that is just you've accepted? <laughs> Um, I also want to make sure talking to your authors about style guide is very important because they are typically the ones that can't point out the tricky content. Um, so, for example, one of the issues I've mentioned before was the computer code in this book. Um, the authors, the editors and I, I didn't realize that that was going to be a tricky item. I completely didn't even think about it. I figured, oh, it's fine. It's just basically strings of text. I was very, 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 very wrong. Um, so once we got the kind of page proofs and looked at the computer code and realized that those couldn't even be typed in correctly, that became an, an issue. So I think going to the authors and asking, are there things that need to look a certain way, things like computer code or equations or tables, in order to be properly understood by a reader, the things that we might not recognize. And that, that way, those things can be fit into the style guide beforehand to avoid issues in the future. Um, sometimes authors also have a design or layout preference. So this kind of feeds into how many, how much um, autonomy are you giving the author or how much autonomy does the author have over the project, but um, making sure that they have some, or have the, asking them if they have any specific preferences can be helpful as well as, um, I kind of already addressed this one, but is there any content that needs to be displayed a certain way? I mean, something else I've run into a lot is um, does a figure have to be located next to a certain paragraph, even thinking about stuff like that in order for it to be read properly by a student, or can it be moved to the next page, especially if you're using a system that's just going to generate a print book. Sometimes like in press books, um, a figure will, if you're just spitting out the PDF, the figure, figure might end up on the next page, but you really want that figure to be right next to that content so that way the reader is looking at it side by side. Um, other people to share the style guide with would be editors, vendors, et cetera. So this file systems engineering book actually had a whole team of editors. Every chapter was authored by different people. Um, so not only are the authors a part of this, but then we also have to consider what the editor's input are. And not every book has an editor, but this is something to consider if you are working with them. Um, so what do the editors have any specific input? Are you following any standards of their fields that they would like you to be aware of? And then also vendors, um, a vendor can only create a book a certain way if you tell them to. So a style guide can be very helpful to a vendor if you're saying that I want the computer code and the tables to look this way, they can just look at it and say, okay, we can do that. Uh, most of the time when we were working with Scribe, for example, they had actually sent us a question sheet beforehand about specific things and I filled it out, but I. I didn't anticipate all of those things. So <laughs> knowing now moving forward to that these things would be a part of it, I would have filled out that, that questionnaire with tricky items that I had not anticipated. Um, so that's a lot about kind of preparing to work with your authors, um, but then there's also the fact of actually doing the work. And that is something that, is easier said than done. You want to make sure you're following up on the expectations you set in the CFP and the MOU, and that you're checking in regularly using the communication method that you chose, whether that's email or Slack or the project management tool. And something else that I really like to push is document everything. And I mean, everything, meeting notes, emails, decisions, especially the decisions and why you made those decisions and workflows. Um, and then make sure everything's in one place where everyone on your team can find it. Um, so again, when I was working at Cengage, um, somebody had left during the time I was there and I had absorbed a bunch of her projects. I mean, we were working on like 10 to 20 books at a time. So this was a lot of stuff that we were dealing with at once. And I absorbed her projects and it turned out that a lot of the documentation she had was on her com personal computer. So I didn't had nothing. I'm absorbing these projects in the middle of the process and I'm going, oh my goodness, what's happening here? I don't know what to do with these things. And that was kind of like my first learning moment. So when I actually left Cengage, I made sure everything was in those systems 
because even though I was leaving them, I didn't want to leave my coworkers who I had built nice relationships with, with nothing. I didn't want them to be stuck in a situation where they couldn't figure out what happened in this book and why did we make the decision to maybe put this figure above this paragraph versus below, even though our style, our publishing style guide typically has us place it here. And these are literally the detailed things that we would get into with some of the information that we documented. Um, so that's really important to share, um, make sure it's in a place everyone can find. So at SunGage, we made sure that we had all of that documentation within our JIRA tickets. So that way when I did end up leaving, I just assigned those JIRA tickets to the people taking over the projects. They had all the information, everything was fine. It was easy peasy. <laughs> and then in this process, you'll be working with the author, but there's also a good chance you'll be working with other parties at the same time. So there can be a lot of email communication or Slack communication happening where you might be talking to the author on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, but you might also be talking to vendors and societies on a regular basis. Um, so other things to consider when you're talking to them are what are their goals with this project, what's their expertise, and how do those things fit into the roles and responsibilities. So again, this book, this bad book that is stuck on my mind because we're still finishing it up. Um, <laughs> we partnered with um, their association, the Association of Something Something Biosystems Engineering, ASABE. And um, so they did a lot of the copy editing for us because they had a copy editor on staff who understands the field and knows what to look for when reading this stuff where I, I don't. Um, and then we also partnered with Scribe to do the typesetting and layout. So making sure that everybody was aware of who is doing what piece of this process at any given point was really important. And in those cases, sometimes it's even helpful to create an additional agreement or MOU. Virginia Tech has deactivated the previous alert. Sorry, guys. We have an alert right now, and my computer's talking to me. So I'm sorry if you heard that. <laughs> um, and then also, similar to working with authors, you'll want to set a schedule to check in regularly with these people and ask them lots of questions. <laughs> Um, so staying on track, if you're not using a project management system, and even if you are, I highly recommend creating a checklist. This checklist can be integrated with a project management system, or it can be something that's in an existing um, Google spreadsheet. A lot of our stuff, we use Google spreadsheets to do checklists with still, just because they're easy. It's easy to find, and it's already in our publishing team drive that we can easily access. Everybody on the team can access, so even if I were to suddenly quit tomorrow, which I'm totally not going to do, but if I were, <laughs> everybody on my team would know exactly what's been done. Um, so this checklist should include everything from large items like the layout of the book to small things like ISBNs. Do you have an ebook that you want to separate ISBN from the print book? Um, do you have an ebook and PDF and EPUB? Do you want different ISBNs for the two of those? So just making sure you have all of that documented and ready to be checked off once it's done. And then also identifying who would work on each item. So our checklist, for example, tend to have a column and we'll just put the initials of the person working on the item. And that's really easy. It says CG, I know that's me, I should be doing something and I do it. Um, and then anything special, the checklist is also good to note those special items in there as well. So that way it's constantly on your mind and you're checking them just to make sure that the computer code is rendering properly and <laughs> the equations look the way they're supposed to. So what to do when things go wrong, because um, as much as you can try and try and try, something will always go wrong. Um, communication can stop, schedules will change, something will get missed, some steps might be rushed and that might make something missed and then you're looking at fixing those mistakes in the future. Um, there could be a misunderstanding and there could be staffing changes. So the best thing to do is reach out, especially if it's with your author, talk to them as much as possible. If they're not responding to emails, keep emailing them. Um, if there's no other way, I would say usually go to their office because that's what I would do in normal times when nobody's working in their offices right now. So that's kind of difficult, um, but try and get in touch with people as much as possible evaluate and edit your schedule and review your checklist. Um, I say edit your schedule. This book was originally supposed to be published in July of 2020. 
it is now February 2021. So we did change the schedule a whole lot because things were happening and it was more important to produce a quality product than to kind of rush to get things done. But at all points in time, we did have those conversations and make sure that everybody involved was aware of the change in schedule. Um, you can refer back to your MOU and your stated goals and any documentation you have if necessary. And then if absolutely necessary, think about what you can cut and maybe work on later. So actually for this textbook, um, the author really needed it done by a semester. He was teaching it in this class, but we didn't have the alt tags and the accessibility figured out yet for the first version. So what we did, we got the print version ready because we don't need the accessibility for the print version. And then we got a PDF up online and it wasn't ideal, really truly wasn't. But then we went back and made sure the PDF was fully accessible for users in the future. But we wanted to make sure that we got something out there as much as possible. Um, and then something that I actually just recently added this to the, the, my slides, take notes on what you can improve in the future. Every book is a learning process. And if something's going wrong, maybe that's something that you can learn from and try to avoid in the future. So for this book, we learned accessibility was a lot harder than we realized it was going to be. So in the future, now we kind of allow for more time to do accessibility work on our textbooks. Um, I mentioned for this book, we're doing a style guide now because I learned that there's a lot of tricky items in biological systems and engineering um, that I wasn't prepared for. And that's kind of something that I think is the, probably the most important. Something's gonna go wrong, that's fine. Use it as a learning opportunity and see how you can fix that in the future or maybe avoid it in the future. And then there's this kind of notion of self-care. Um, so I just wanna remind everybody, it's okay if something goes wrong, if this happens to everyone. Um, it's totally normal. I'd say if you have a project that goes smoothly, I'd be more surprised than if you had something go wrong in a project. Um, and then you don't have to know everything. Um, I openly admit that I know nothing about engineering. I'm married to an engineer, but I have no idea what he does. So when I look at some of these engineering textbooks, I just kind of cringe. So that's where it kind of goes into the ask for help. I ask around, I ask our partners. Um, I've been working with a scholarly association. I ask them for help. Um, I also tend to look for resources on campus. So when we were first doing accessibility, it was my first time dealing with that level of math and a PDF. Um, I actually went to our accessible technologies office on campus. And they had this day of open office hours where anybody could ask questions. I spent seven hours in their office <laughs> asking questions and working through these things. And they are some of the most amazing people ever because they also had snacks for me. So. <laughs> I um, highly recommend just asking around. People tend to be more willing to help than I think we anticipate. Um, and then make sure you have an open conversation about challenges to the MOU and stated goals, especially with your authors or editors or anybody. If they're really pushing in something, um, maybe they're not okay with a certain license on the book and you've already agreed to it. That's, that's something to push back on and that's okay. And just understand that that's okay. And maybe sometimes you have to say no. Um, so if something's really not happening, it's okay to say no. Um, it's, I think especially for myself, I'm a trained librarian. I always struggle with saying no to people. I want to help everybody, but it's not always possible. Um, so that can be some of the hardest stuff to think about. Um, so that was kind of a lot. I want to open it up for questions. Thank you, Corinne. And there's been a great conversation in the chat. And I think there might be a couple unanswered questions here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, review the chat. But if any of you have something top of mind, feel free to unmute and um, share your question with all of us. Lots of Overleaf fans. We have Overleaf here too. We haven't done a full textbook in it, but I know that there's been some other things done in it. It's really powerful. Okay, here is a question from Rebel. Do you let each author set their own style or pick a style as a publisher and then modify author content to sort of meet your style guide? That's a really great question. I think in the past, um, we've always let authors set their own style. Um, 
we've had conversations recently about maybe for to in order to produce more it would it might be better to have at least some set style but then there's the question of author autonomy and i think that's a really interesting question so i think having some idea of what your publishing program is willing to allow authors to do um, can be really helpful in making that decision moving forward. Mm -hmm. Does that answer that question? I feel like that's kind of a roundabout way of answering it. <laughs> what do you think, Rebel? Okay, we'll take it for now. And if we <laughs> want to revisit it, we can. Um, so Corinne, before we started today, you were talking about that biosystems engineering book and you mentioned that it has just about everything anyone could possibly imagine um, snagging you up in a textbook um, and that you look forward to perhaps working on a humanities textbook one day in the future. Can you say more about, um, you know, how the work was split up chapter by chapter and some of the collaborations, maybe just talk a little bit more about that particular project because it seems like it was, a, it was a wonderful learning opportunity. Yes, um, okay, so this book was led by four people. There are four editors, two here at Virginia Tech, two at an institution in Ireland actually. Um, and they had this idea to create kind of a worldwide learning resource, something that would pull perspectives from authors from all over the world, not just necessarily like one area. So there are um, chapters from authors everywhere. Some chapters have one author, some chapter I think have as many as five or six authors. I know that we have authors that are from Africa, I believe, some in Europe, I think some in South America, I'm trying to remember where else, but really everywhere. So I think from like a learning perspective, it's really fantastic that students are gonna have a resource that really applies different perspectives <laughs> to these, these concepts. Um, but from a publishing perspective, it's a little scary. Uh, we had to collect um, publishing agreements from each author. Mm -hmm. um, and then as well as there's also sections. So the chapters are split into sections. I think there's five or six sections in the book. And each section also has a set of section editors on top of these four main editors. So we have like the four main editors, the section editors, and then the authors. Um, so just a lot of people to manage. Um, things kind of got lost in control. I mean, there was things early on that I noticed that not all the chapters had the same basic structure. So every chapter here starts with, um, key terms and then a list of variables and then an introduction and then kind of the chapter outcomes in a box and then it gets into the concepts which is like the meat of the chapter and there are some chapters when I first got these where I was looking at them I'm going every chapter doesn't have all of these things and some of the chapters aren't following the same order some chapters had outcomes before the key terms um, so that was something I had to then go back and I worked with the editors, not something that will go into my style guide when I do create it, <laughs> but I went back and worked with the editors. Okay, what's the ideal, um, what's the ideal order of these things? I'm happy to move them around, but what's the ideal order? And then also there are a few chapters that don't have these things, should they have them? And then once that was, I mean, that was one piece. And then each chapter would then go to ASABE, the Scholarly Association for copy editing, and then come to us. Um, and then I would compose them and send them to Scribe for layout and everything. And then I, we would go back and forth to Scribe in terms of checking and making checking the content. And I would work with the four main editors to check the content. But even when we were looking back and forth at page proofs, there was a certain point where even the four main editors said, we're not gonna let the authors look at these anymore because that's too many eyes on it, people would start getting nitpicky about things like, oh, I can't believe I wrote that, I wanna change it to this. And we were like, no, no more changes. <laughs> um, so I think just the amount of people was a big thing happening, but then the content itself, it's a biosystems engineering book. Um, it has chapters with lots of math. I think there was like close to a thousand equations in this book. There are several chapters with tables. Um, there is the one chapter with computer code. There's also several figures that are a little bit more complex and we didn't actually, we kind of left it open to the authors to how they wanted to submit the figures. So there were a few figures that were submitted in programs I had never used before. At one point I was downloading random programs that I found on Google onto my computer, hoping that maybe I could open this figure to generate a JPEG. <laughs> 
Um, so I think in the future, I would probably go in and request if you're not using a program that we, like one of our InDesign or um, PowerPoint or something that I easily have access to, I need you to submit in JPEG or TIFF. Um, so thinking about the, those things. So there's just, in terms of the content, there was pretty much every piece of content in there that could cause question. <laughs> and then also there was a lot of moving pieces in terms of the authors and the editors and the publishers ourselves. <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds like an incredible project because to have that many players and that content and that many tools, it's a lot to reconcile and to, and to get it to all hold together for that student reading experience so that it's consistent and structured and will work for what sounds like you know, audiences all around the world is quite a feat. So a lot of questions came in as you were talking about it, Corinne. So um, the first one from Heather, do you hold up publishing if the alt text and other accessibility formatting isn't in yet? And it sounds like uh, based on your experience, it depends and you have to kind of make the call depending on the most pressing need. Is there anything um, you'd like to add to that? Nope, I think it really depends. Uh, it depends on the most pressing need and also the technology used. Um, right. If it's something like working with Scribe where we're asking them to add the alt text and the, do the accessibility that needs to happen earlier on because we don't necessarily want to go back and do that ourselves. Um, if it's something where we, it's easy for us to go back and do ourselves, then that, that might be a case where it would be okay to hold on that. Um, and, and that too, I think connects to something we've talked about a few times during Pub 101, which is you know covering early on this question of who is going to do the alt text? Um, most people would recommend it be the author since they understand how the information fits into the larger context of the book. Um, but clarifying that in the beginning, I think could be helpful too, especially to this question of, you know, it, might it hold up the publication if it's, you know, kind of holistically incorporated into the writing and production of the book, it might help with it not holding up production rather than if it's left kind of as like a final thing to do on the checklist. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, from Rebecca, what is the cost of that text and how was it funded? Um, the cost for us, <laughs> well, it's about 20 some thousand dollars. <laughs> it's coming out of, since we are a published unit in the library, it's coming out of our library budgets. Um, then we also have an OER grant initiative that Anita Walls, our open education, I forget her full title, the Assistant Director of Open Education um, here at Virginia Tech. She runs this uh, grant program that's like $3,000 grant. So we were able to kick that towards it. And then um, the editors as well are going to pitch in, I think like $5,000 um, to help lower the cost. <laughs> and, and this is you know unique or exciting. One of the things we've talked about over the years in open education publishing is the potential of partnering with scholarly societies. And so it's really great that you have an example of doing that and you know starting with a model for what that could look like. Now with something, you know, $20,000 being a significant amount of money that's out of reach for many, um, what kind of ways do you um, sort of show return on investment for that that would work, you know, no matter what people are spending on book production, um, but if they can show, you know, hey, we spent this much making it, however, here's been the impact. Um, are you a part of those um, conversations or what does that look like? I don't look at that too much directly. So since Anita kind of runs our whole open education program, I know she collects stats every year and these go into our reports, like to our dean and all our, our year end reports about how much money um, open textbooks are saving students. So we will gather, okay, roughly this many students are in a class in a given year. Um, the textbook they previously used might've been $250. So $250 times 60 students, how much is that? And that's how much we save students on this campus that year. Um, and then we'll also look at that over time. So our one of our biggest books, The Fundamentals of Business, which I have the second edition here, and this one was not $20,000 to create, not anywhere close to that. <laughs> but that book, um, there, there were actually, I think we just released a third edition at some point in the past few months that I wasn't as actively involved in. Um, but since it's been going on since about 20. 16, I want to say, that book has been building up and building up to save thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for our students on campus. 
And I know that that's, that's really one of the biggest arguments that we make to continue to receive funding for some of these projects is that we are saving students money on campus. And then we're also drawing attention to the work of our own faculty on campus. The, we're supporting our faculty and um, making sure that they're, they're able to share their scholarship in some ways, all of those pieces. Great. Um, now, Corinne, you've been holding up all of these wonderful print examples, and I know many of us, few and far between, have the opportunity these days to hold something in our hands to show for the work that we've done or invested over the years. So um, related to that, Marilyn has a question about how you deal with the printing of your textbook. So how did you get these fine copies in hand? We currently use um, Amazon's Kindle Direct Publishing for print-on-demand things. Um, so we just have a system with them and we'll put a book in and we'll order X many like kind of copies for us to be able to do wonderful things like this with, um, but then we'll also order copies for our authors and editors. And then it's available on Amazon for any students that want to buy it. So this book is 570 pages. It's in color. It's $35. Um, I can pull out some of my husband's engineering textbooks that are behind me, I guarantee, even though that was over 10 years ago that he paid a couple hundred mm -hmm. dollars on those textbooks. So it's, it's kind of nice. <laughs> and do you have any information on how many print copies sell? Like, is that a popular format or students using more e-versions? I don't have any of that off the top of my head. I think that's a really interesting question. It's something that I'm always curious about, especially with this book, because I know the editors for this book are more interested in the PDF and the digital versions. Um, sometimes we're talking about adding new chapters and they're, they're not as concerned about how do we add new chapters to the print. They're very much interested in the digital versions. Um, but it'd be interesting to know like what the download numbers for our textbooks are versus like for our eBooks versus our, the buying numbers from Amazon. And I think we have that somewhere. I just don't have it off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, John is asking, have you had experience with authors that have asked for alternatives to OER print version? And can you speak to digital only version, which you were, were sort of getting into there? Um, yeah. So I actually also, um, a, bigger, a big part of my job too is working on digital humanities projects. So a lot of the work I do is actually only on digital only versions. Um, there are a lot of tools and platforms out there and I think that they're really powerful and they can also do new things. Um, so I mentioned Pressbooks and we use that for Fundamentals of Business, the second and third editions. And one of the things that we really like about that is we're able to incorporate the H5P plugin to be able to have kind of questions to check for understanding throughout the text. We also are able to embed some YouTube and Vimeo videos into the text so they're not sending students someplace else that they're actually just right there um, and then we've done that with a, we've been using Pressbooks more and more. We have a Pressbooks uh, institution account now. So we're using that more and more for some of the more digital interactive versions. I think we have a textbook recently where the authors just said, no, I'm not even interested in the print on demand. Um, I'm not as actively involved in that one, but um, I think it's becoming more common. But with the digital humanities projects I do, I tend to work a little bit broader than maybe even looking at a book format. Some of these are more of like an interactive database. Some of these might be um, like an Omeka online exhibit type of situation. Um, and not all of these are necessarily meant to be OER, but I think a lot of people use them as OER somewhat and especially within the humanities world. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know if that answers the question or if you have any specific questions about what digital only version and kind of the pieces that go into it. John says thanks in the chat, so. No, not uh, for now. So I just wanted to just get a, a first blush with some of the trends and some of the pressures that we might have in thinking about OER and OER differently than maybe traditionally we are currently doing this practice. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for the questions and comments and, and sharing information in the chat. Uh, we have a couple minutes left. If anyone has a burning question, um, they would like to ask Corinne about the publishing program at Virginia Tech or any of the specific tools she's been using or the intricacies of trying to get things to appear on a page as you want them to appear, um, which can be, you know, 
quite a battle sometimes. I will pause for a moment to see if there is um, anything left unsaid. This is Heather. Can I just ask for, I'm curious, I heard that you have the hosted version of Pressbooks, like you pay for uh, the professional rather than self-hosting on the campus. Do you have problems with the layout of the books changing when they update Pressbooks or WordPress? Um, I haven't experienced that directly. Um, I know it's been discussed. I haven't had that problem specifically with Pressbooks. I've, I do a lot with Omeka as well, and I have had issues with that in Omeka where I go in and something is completely broken. Um, yeah, so I haven't dealt with Pressbooks specifically. I wanna say that there is some setting somewhere in the back though that allows you to like hold off updates, but I might be wrong. So don't quote me on that. Okay, I was just curious. I mean, we have big problems with that with the self-hosted version. Yeah, that's definitely an issue I run into with Omeka and I've seen it with WordPress as well. Um, and I've definitely always warned people, um, especially in, digital humanities projects to be wary of how much custom code they're applying to some projects because it's more likely to break with updates. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to back, back up that code somewhere. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the question, Heather. It's frustrating when things change like that on you. Okay, I'm going to start my closing comments. Feel free to interrupt. And um, I can, yeah, throw my, I was just going to say I can throw my email and our publishing website into the chat for anybody who maybe has other questions um, or is interested in learning more. Great. Thank you, Corinne. Mm -hmm. And so this is our time to, to thank Corinne uh, for joining us and sharing her expertise. Corinne, I would also like to say again, congratulations on finishing that uh, incredible project and the other projects that you've really um, invested so much time and expertise into. We have one session to go for Pub 101. I hope to see you all again next week when Kevin will join us to talk about printing. Some of you had printing questions today. And I think um, we can spend some time talking more generally about how to mark the closing of a publishing project, which is a significant accomplishment for everyone involved and to take that opportunity to acknowledge such. And so without further ado, I will say farewell and take care and hope to see you next week. Bye.